You know, one of the great things about going to church is that you learn things. Um, things that you have said um, many, many times suddenly become new because of whatever's going on in your life. And so even before I get into the message today, I was just thinking about how yesterday we had a men's group here, right? And we were praying the Lord's Prayer, so it was great to hear it from the kids. And remember what we said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Men, what, is, what did we talk about? What did we say that means? It's not just the spiritual struggle, Lord, you know, help me not to get into trouble and if I do get into trouble, get me out. We said, no, Lord, lead us into the fires of other people's lives, but don't let it overwhelm us so that we can deliver them out like you've delivered us. Make me a spiritual first responder. It's a whole different way to pray that prayer. And it's kind of the image I want to build into you today in our message. We are God's people like we've been hearing in our songs and in our liturgy, but we're here for a purpose. We've been fashioned for a time like this. And so I actually read the last verse of Esther, or the 15th verse uh, of, the, of Esther, where it says, Esther does finally rise to the occasion, and she says back to Mordecai these words, um, Say to Mordecai, I will go to the king. So I'll do what you tell are asking me to do. But it's against the law. And if I die, I die. I just want to be useful in God's hands for others. Let's talk about that today. God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we get into his word. Uh, pretty dramatic stuff, wouldn't you agree? I mean, when you read the book of Esther, when you read Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, uh, Daniel, this is dramatic stuff. This is what happens sometimes when even the good things of faith run contrary to the powers of the world. And I think when you look at this text, I think you're seeing what I call sanctified solitude, which means when people really understand that they are, they are saved by grace alone in Christ, they know that they are receiving the love of Christ as a gift. There's a, there's a solitude to that. There's a confidence to that. No matter what's going on in the world, I know he is still in control of my life. Sanctified solitude. But then what does it mean when you actually then are willing to be faithful to him in the world in which we live for the sake of others? That's what we want to talk about, the sanctified solitude as it's sent into the world, how it blesses even those with whom we disagree. Today we're going to talk about how one woman, Esther, I mean, think about what she did. She just did what Mordecai said God had placed her in the king's court to do. She didn't know how it was going to end up. She was going to be faithful to God and faithful to the promises of God. We don't, have a whole, we don't have time to do a whole Old Testament study here, but the point is, in the Old Testament, God makes a promise to save the world. That's Genesis 3. Then he puts that promise in a family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He literally says, watch, I'm faithful. I'm going to put it in a family so when it comes to fruition, you will know that I keep my promises to my people. And when did it come to fruition? Christmas morning. But it had some bumps in the road. <laughs> and this is one of those bumps because this regime decided that promise, the promised people were illegal and he was going to wipe them out. Well, that's this cosmic thing. If he wipes out the promise and there's no Jesus, if there's no Jesus, there's no salvation. Esther doesn't know all that. She just knows that she's going to be faithful to the God who is faithful to them. Wow. Dramatic stuff. Now, this is a Lutheran church, and there's this guy named Luther who stood up by himself one time, too. Same kind of thing. He, was, he suddenly discovered what the Bible taught, and he began to realize that it was not really at, in concert with the regime of the day. And so literally they said, recant this teaching that you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. You better stand down. And he said, no, i got to stand up. And he was the only one at that moment. They literally excommunicated. They literally said that he could be killed at any moment. And so he literally gave his life for this. Why? Because he knew Christ gave his life for him. And that's all. When, when all you have is Jesus, that's all you need. And he learned that. Well, that's why we're here today. Because he stood up for it. And now we know it's true for us too. So today, the power of a sent life 
in the solitude and confidence that comes by grace through faith in Jesus. All right, first things first. Um, let's, let's be real about this. Uh, things can get very scary in the world in which we live. Would you agree with me on that? I mean, if you don't, April 15th still scares the daylights out of me, you know? Uh, every year, it's like, oh, I got to make sure, you know? So the world can get a scary place. And then if you ever transgress it, you know, sometimes people say the state is a benevolent thing. They, they'll, no, they aren't, because if you don't, you know, if you didn't give an offering today, would, would these pastors chase you down? No, that's benevolence. You freely give, right? You freely give, and then it's freely given away. April 15th isn't free. So this is the benevolence agency of this culture, not the state. Anyway, that's, that's yesterday's talk. But I said that this can be scary sometimes, and what you're seeing in this particular text, uh, this is what happens when faith, the things of God, run contrary to the things of this world. And suddenly Esther was in some real trouble. And, you know, there's stuff happening on the hill uh, that I, I really don't want to have to tell you. But again, when they look at some of the things of faith and, and, and the fact that there's a higher authority uh, that we all give homage to, sometimes that makes those um, government types real nervous. And so they like to make laws to kind of put you in your place. Well, that's what was happening in our text. She and her people were a threat to the kingdom, even though they were there to be a blessing to the kingdom. Wow. So the world is unfair sometimes. It can be frightening sometimes, even for God's people. And it doesn't take much then if you're really afraid to feel very, very alone. That's why I had the second reading that I wanted you to hear. And that's where Paul says, look, if you're really, really afraid, and I don't know what's going on in your life right now, you might be terrified of some things. Maybe people don't even know that you're scared. Well, if you are, and there's all kinds of reasons why we can be, uh, Paul says this to you. If God is for you, nothing can stand against you. And then he says, well, shall trouble, who, who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No. Even in those things, you're already conquerors. You're already victors because of who Jesus is. So that, that's the first thing. If you've ever been truly afraid, we need to understand. That's just the human condition. You know, I, again, I was just thinking of things that you just did. I wonder if you really even knew what was happening. We start our services in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And see, people say, well, that's liturgical. No, that's just proclaiming the reality of what this place is. And I don't know if you know this, but where the Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he is here, and now this is holy ground. That's why we confess our sins next, because we can't stand on holy ground because of who we are. And that's why we need his forgiveness and his covering. And that just happens when we say in the name of the Father, the Son, it's a sacred place. Wow. So have you ever been truly afraid? And then what does God say then? You know, I remember I was thinking of a time, and I know this sounds silly. I was, I was hoping the kids were still going to be here because I think it identifies with the kids. But I was six or seven years old one time, and I can still remember being terrified. Uh, anybody like horror movies? Don't raise your hand because I don't want to know. I hate them. I mean, I just do. They, they st I still don't watch them as an adult, especially because a lot of it now is it gets into the spiritual realm, and I don't want to mess, okay? But anyway, so when I was a kid, you know, my buddies used to always say, hey, come on over to the house, you know, we'll watch it. And one time I was over, and we're watching this horror film. Man, I hated it. It scared me to death. Now, of course, I didn't tell them that. But then when I went home, I couldn't sleep. You ever been like this? You're so terrified. It's a big thing to be terrified like that. I remember in my bed, my dad says, go to sleep, son. I remember laying in bed. He turned off the light. Yeah! And as soon as he closed the door, I ran over, turned the light on, and I wouldn't get back in bed. You know? And my dad says, Greg, get in bed. And I'm the oldest, so I got no adult, you know, older brothers to even talk to about this. Dad, I'm scared. Get to bed. Comes up, turns the light off, you know, puts me in bed. Close the door. As soon as he get run out, I ran up, turned the light on, got up, and wouldn't get in bed. Finally, the third time he comes in, and, and, and like I said, I can remember this to this day. He said, Gregory, go to sleep. Now, Dad doesn't always, you know, 
he was getting a little frustrated, but he didn't get mad at me. What did he do, good dads? What did he do? He actually, you know, I said, Dad, there's somebody in the closet. What did he do? He went over and checked it out. Son, look, there's nothing in the closet. He even checked under the bed. He got down on his hands and knees and checked under the bed. And here's what I remember the most. And then he went in the doorway, turned the light off, and he stood there, and the, the, the light of the hallway was still behind him. He looked like Captain America. <laughs> and he said, now, Gregory, I've checked everything, but know this. I'm here. You and my, you, your mother and I, we're here. We're downstairs, and as long as we're here, nothing can harm you. Now go to sleep. Wow. When you're truly afraid, you need something bigger than your fear. And that's what this text is talking about. You know, the world is a sinful place. Satan does prowl around like a roaring lion. That's true. And when you meet it, it scares you to death. But even when you're most afraid, we have a Savior who is bigger than our fears. And he's the one who makes incredible promises to people like us when we're most afraid. You know, to the thief on the cross, what did he say? Today you will be with me in paradise. Wow. Who does he think he is? Well, I'll tell you who he is. He's the God who can make that promise come true. To the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. And if Christ doesn't condemn you, then your sins are forgiven. But now go and sin no more. Don't bring that evil back into your life because you're mine now. To Lazarus dead in the grave, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, he said, come out. And he was really dead. And he was really alive. You know, so we have these verses, because I live, Jesus says, you will live also. So again, this text, when the world seems strongest and our fear is greatest, when we feel all alone, when all we have is God and our faith in him, Jesus and our faith in him, that is enough. And that's what Esther knew. That's what Luther knew. And that's what we know. So Jesus understands the terror of this world. He's faced it even in a way you can't even imagine because that's what Good Friday is all about. And he is the one who now says, as the resurrected Lord, neither will I leave you, neither will I forsake you. You are mine. You're safe in my hands. You know, I always love to tell the story of... Um, like I said, I've done urban ministry all my life. I, I'm a pastor. That's what I've always wanted to be, and, and that's and pastor in cities. That's, I want to pastor in the cities. Um, and so New York, L.A., D Dallas, that kind of thing. And one of the things when we were in New York, we, we had a Girl Scout troop. One of the reasons why is because most of the girls in New York had never seen grass. You know, they had never seen trees. It was blacktop city. And so my wife used to love to take them out into the country to see a radically different view of the world. Well, this is a mother like that. She took her daughter to the Girl Scout Jamboree. Do we still do these things? I know, the world's crazy now. Um, but this was one of those times where she took it, and she wasn't a camper type, you know, but she wanted her daughter to be with all the rest of the girls, so they went on this camping trip. They're in a canvas, you know, tent. She is closing it for the night, the zipper as they're getting in the sleeping bags, and a bee gets inside the tent. And it just happens to be the biggest bee they have ever seen in their life. You know, it's a Vegas bee, you know. And, you know, when that thing's buzzing and you got a little girl in there, she's terrified. Why? Why is she terrified? Because it could sting and it could hurt and some people have reactions to that. It can get really messy. Anyway, mommy, mommy, take care of it, take care of it. And the mother did this. And she caught this thing. What did it do? Stung her. Now, she did something unique that I think mothers do, but no father would do. <laughs> father may have done the same thing, but he would have then gone, <laughs> that's the end of that bee. But she said, let it live. You know? <laughs> so she released it into the tent, and it's still buzzing around, and the daughter's, oh, it's going to know. And what did she say? Honey, it can't hurt you anymore. Why? Bees have one stinger. She said, look at my hands. It's right here. And then they somehow ushered it out. Look at my hands when you're most afraid. That's what Jesus is saying to us. That's what Mordecai was saying to Esther. 
He even said to her, he said, look, if you don't do anything, God's still going to save us because he keeps his promises, but it's not going to be good for you. But you have a moment in time to be his people, to be this for the sake of others, and God can do great things even through someone like you. Just be who you are in Christ and watch what happens. Amazing. So I close with this thought to you. You know, I, I think it's sometimes really good um, to know that no matter what's going on in this world, and believe me, in my work in Washington, I need to hear this day after day. No matter what is happening in this world, we are already more than victors in Christ. We are already free in Christ. Christ says it is for freedom that I have set you free. The government doesn't set me free. Christ sets me free. But I want to live in freedom for others. Thank God I live in this country to do that. That's fine. But my freedom comes from above. It comes through the cross. So it's good to know. It's good to hear that, you know, this Jesus who opens up his hands and says, you are safe in my hands. Paul says, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor height, nor death, nor anything in this world, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ. That's good to know. You are saved by grace through faith in him. And nobody can take that away. The last part of this message, though, is that God sends us into the chaos of this world as his people. So be who you are in Christ for others. That's the solitude of faith that's willing to be sent into the world as it is. So remember the story of Esther, what it teaches us. It teaches us not to, not to just be happy that we're unafraid. That's good. But also then to be those unafraid people who are willing to move into the world and share what we know to be true so that others can be unafraid too. Now, in closing, I'm going to ask you if you're on this list. But I started to think about it. Sometimes we make Matthew 28, which is, you know, Jesus sends us, you know, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. We almost have it like this, like he's wagging his finger at us. I think we're wrong on that because, first of all, it's not, the word is not go, like, a, like it's a command. It's as you're going. While you're going. While you're living the life that God has given you to live, while you're doing that, make disciples. You know, so the whole point is, is God is saying, look, this is not, again, me wagging my finger at you and trying to kick you out the door. It's just be who you are in me and then open yourself up to the possibility that I can send people to you that you can bless. That's it. That, to me, is a whole exciting life. That means when I'm 90 years old, he's still going to be sending me somebody. When I'm 10 years old, he's still going to be sending me somebody. It doesn't matter what age I'm at. It doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter whether I'm in success or I'm in struggle. I can be useful in his hands for others, and he will always hold me in his hands. That's the final message. You're Christ's people. Don't just be happy with the way things are. It's nice to be happy with the way things are, but be the kind of people who want to move into other people's lives with the transforming power of God's word. Consider your calling. And in your calling, that means whatever you're doing, whatever you're gifted to do, you can be an Esther. You can be a Luther. You can be even a St. Paul. Hmm. That's probably stretching it, right? No, because... Even the apostles themselves were nobodies that God made somebody so that everybody can know who God is. That's just who he is. So consider your calling. Could you be on this list? Ready? I'm going to read some names, and I want to ask, can you be in there someplace? Ready? All right, Moses. Now, Moses was the spokesperson of God in the Old Testament. Everyone reveres Moses. Did you know that he stuttered? He could barely speak? Wow. Um, David was supposed to be this great warrior. He was a runt. He, the, the armor didn't even fit. And yet he was the warrior who took down Goliath. Wow. John Mark, Paul rejected him. Timothy had ulcers. He worried a lot. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. That'll get in the way of your ministry. <laughs> that's, that's a little... But God actually said, take Gomer as your wife because that's what Israel's like to me and I want you to love her the way I have to love you. Oh man, that's a, a sermon text for another day. Amos is only training us in school of fig tree pruning. Jacob, the great Jacob, was a liar. 
David had an affair. Solomon was too rich. Mary was too poor. Abraham was too old. David was too young. Peter was afraid of death. And Lazarus was dead. (laughs) No one laughed. That's funny. God chose Lazarus and he resurrected him from the dead. I I always wonder, he probably came back and said, why are you bringing me back? He had to then live the rest of his life and die again. But he lived as a testimony to the resurrection. Powerful stuff. Jonah ran from God. Miriam was a gossip. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burned out. Remember? He's like, I've done everything that you wanted me to, and now everyone's against me. Oh, poor, poor me. And then God's like, oh my gosh. You know, it just shows how we can miss the whole point. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and even Esther thought they were going to die. And yet God protects. And by the way, Samson had long hair. I don't know why I mentioned that. As I get older, that doesn't seem to be a big issue, you know. But as we think about these things, I'm asking, could you be on that list? And the answer is yes, because God always chooses us, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And then sometimes he chooses the least of us so that he can demonstrate his grace to the most of us. To that end, learn today the power of the solitude of faith as it is sent into this world. Just be yourselves in Christ for others. Be open to whatever happens because you get to live the abundant, forgiven, graced life now and forever. May God overwhelm you with his grace and courage in your efforts to boast in him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Amen.